I'll give you an example you, using my approach, but just to give you an example, Y Combinator is obviously the biggest incubator mm -hmm. on the planet. In the last 10 years, Y Combinator invested in 140 B rounds. So not very many. They, they do 250 no. companies every six months. They did 140 B rounds. My algorithm predicted 124 of them. I, yeah. stole your, I stole your screenshot. I downloaded it. Hi, I'm Keith Tia, and you're listening to Gut Talks, double G-U-double-T. Keith Tier is an English-American tech entrepreneur. He has founded or co-founded several companies since the early 80s and was a founding shareholder of TechCrunch. He's currently the CEO of SignalRank that he's been working on for a long time behind the scenes. It's an investment platform that uses data intelligence, which is changing venture investing one data point at a time. He uses his background in political science and sociology to analyze market trends and share them with the world in his newsletter, That Was The Week, and the show with Andrew King. Keith has been an influencer in the tech space for four decades and is genuinely a kind person. And according to his wife, she's never met anyone more optimistic than he is. We talk about his journey and how he thinks, signal rank and his approach to building a data-only company. So here we go. This podcast is brought to you by GUT, fostering a culture of innovation to build better products, ventures, and cultures. I'm Maria, and I enjoy adding value and helping wherever I can, widening my spectrum of thoughts, even if it can sometimes challenge the mainstream. This is why we give data a voice and co-create a collective intelligence involving both people who are not always in the limelight and those who are, in order to learn from each other and spread knowledge and critical thinking. All I ask is to rate the show, leave a review, and share it. It's a fantastic way to help other podcast explorers discover our content. I'd love to know more about you and your preferences to continue producing this kind of content. So type in go.gut.com slash talks. It takes 60 seconds to complete. That's go.ggutt.com slash talks. Now let's get started. Keith, thank you so much for being on Gut Talks. As I mentioned before we hit the record button, I've been waiting until I hit 100,000 downloads to invite you on the show. I, I want to say a few things. We met in Palo Alto, right? A few yeah. years ago. And I met your dog as well. And you said a few interesting things and I kept following you, what you're doing. But also that was the week that you started about three years ago. But that also inspired me and my co-host in creating a show in Italian. And I'm not just saying this like that. This is just really on top of mind now. I remember you were talking a lot about the creator economy years ago. You were also writing on Get Review, then you switched to Substack. It boosted me also in continuing the podcast. So you were just telling me that you're not that interesting offline. So I just want to make sure that even though you think you're not that interesting, maybe I think you, um, you have an impact on lots of people. And one of them is me. So I have things I want to talk to you about or ask you about, primarily AI tech investing. But most importantly, how does your brain function? Like, how do you analyze everything? Your background is in political science and sociology. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you've been an entrepreneur for uh, like four decades. So if you just go back in time into your upbringing as well, and then your studies later on, and yeah. then moving into tech, is there anything that like prompted you to get into what you're doing? I don't know if prompt is, is the right word, but the decisions I made in my life were all motivated by the same instinct. And the instinct is to escape irrelevance. I, I, I grew up in a, in a very, very poor part of the UK. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a beach town called Scarborough that has a small working class population um, that, that, um, serves the town, which is mainly retired people. And I was the oldest kid of six. Um, and in those days, the men used to drink heavily. They were not nice to their wives and the home atmosphere was generally speaking terrible. And education wise, it was assumed you would leave school at 15 and go and work in a, in some kind of a manual job. 
factory maybe. And I used to go to school every day seeing these factories that I was destined to work in. And the strongest feeling in my head was uh, I had to escape. Um, I had to get out somehow. And, and so that sense of escaping bad outcomes is, is a very strong driver for me. You know, when you live in that situation, something bad happens pretty much every week, something bad happens. So you grow up expecting negative outcomes. So somewhere you have to find within you optimism. And my, my wife always tells me she's never met anyone as optimistic as I am. Well, that optimism comes from fear of the opposite. <laughs> and, and, okay. and that is deep in your deep in your life, deep in your upbringing. And it really is a sense of survival. It, it really isn't ambition because that would imply confidence. It's the opposite. It's not wanting to fail and being absolutely sure you will unless you do something. And so that is the key. And I, I can give you a few anecdotes, but in England at that time, when you were, I was 10 years old, I, I was like born on the August the 27th. And the cutoff date for a new year in England is September 1st. So I was like the youngest kid always in my year at school. And in England at that time, at the age of 11, you did an exam called the 11 plus. And that exam determined whether you would go into the A stream or the B stream for education for the rest of your life. And it was a kind of an IQ test style exam, patterns, shapes, in numbers, uh, just logic, logic and patterns, abstract thinking. And I, I was only 10 when I took it and I'd never seen one of these tests before. They didn't give you a practice test or anything. So despite that, I kind of was a borderline pass fail. And I remember that when you're a borderline pass fail, the headmaster of the school interviewed you to determine which side you would come down on. And in my interview, they, they only asked me one question because probably there was a lot of kids and they didn't have a lot of time. What does your father do? And I didn't know what my father did because my father worked for the British Secret Service. In, he was a, a former coal miner who during the Second World War got trained in Morse code and cryptography and became a kind of a field station communications guy in the Secret Service. So he couldn't talk about what he did. So my answer was, I have no idea what my father does. Fail. They put me in the B stream. And, and when you're in the B stream, that's the leave school at 15 path. Luckily for me in British politics, Harold Wilson was elected as prime minister in 1964. I was born in 1954. So the year I was put in the B stream, he became the prime minister. And he brought in a Dean age 15 exam that let you try again. And I, okay. I got straight A's at, when I was 15 and I went back into the A stream, which is the stream where you can go to university. The, the minute I showed up in the new school, age 16, immediately you're doing university applications for two years later. My teacher told me not to apply because I had no chance of going before they even knew me just because of where I came from. So, yeah. so you can tell either you become a rebel or you, you basically carry out the life they tell you is your life. So I became a rebel. I was a rebel and I was a rebel all the way through. That's why I studied political science and sociology. I, I wanted to analyze why everything was so bad. Wow. Okay. So, so a few things here. Where did this strength come from at a really young age to be like, no, I'm not going to take this, like what's given to me for an answer or the only option? Yeah. You know, I don't know the answer to that, but my clue is this. I don't think it was strength. I think it was escaping. So just to give you a sense of it, what did I do? We had a, in my, where I lived, there was a library, a public library. I used to go to the library every day and, and get books and I would stay in my room and read. And it was more like escaping into a different world. 
that was under control. And in your thoughts, you can be anywhere. And your life can be anything. So it was really not as much strength. Although, like all kids, I reacted against parental negativity, like my children do today. It's like I, I see the other side now. And I did have a kind of a, that rebel streak. I, remember, I, I can remember a few little things like in 1968, the British army was sent into Northern Ireland. And I remember watching on BBC uh, Irish Catholics protesting for civil rights because they didn't have the equal votes or anything in those days. And I remember seeing a policeman hitting old ladies with a baton. And instinctively, I supported the old ladies, not the police. And, you know, that meant you were on the side of Irish Catholics, Republicans against the British state. And I grew up being a strong believer in Irish independence. And my dad was in the Secret Service, was on the other side, obviously. I, I ended up founding and leading something called the Irish Freedom Movement, which was a campaign for British young people to support Irish independence. And that kind of repeats over and over. I, I, I led campaigns uh, against Margaret Thatcher's invasion of the Falkland Islands, again, you know, against the war in Iraq. I, I, I grew up wanting the underdog to win. So you started in politics and then you thought that maybe tech can have a greater maybe impact or... Yeah. Toy. When I was younger, I thought politics could change the world. Obviously, at some point it can. But when I was still very young, Ronald Reagan became the US president and Margaret Thatcher became the prime minister of the UK. And it became very clear that politics was not a path that you could control the outcomes very easily. And I learned to code when I was about 21. I bought some of the first computers. I was very curious about computers. And I learned to code in order to do digital campaigns to raise money for political causes. So they were, they were kind of joined together. And as soon as I could code, all the people I knew started asking me to do things for them. Could you do this? Could you do that? And, and it ended up when I was in my late twenties, I started writing systems. Uh, I wrote the a &R music system for Warner Brothers Music. And I, I wrote a skills passporting system for mobile oil that determined whether somebody could go on to an oil platform with a skill to do a job. And it, if they could, it issued the passport that they could do this job. So I, I started to understand that you could impact outcomes through tech. In both of those cases, fairly small outcomes. Um, but because of my political past, the scope of my ambition was to affect big things. I, I wanted to impact big things. And, and so I transitioned really from being, I was always fairly entrepreneurial. If I tell you when I was just finished my undergraduate degree and I had started a PhD, I didn't have any income, but I managed to persuade a mortgage company to give me a 100% mortgage to buy a house. In, okay. in, in Birmingham, and I rented out four of the bedrooms. It was a five bedroom house to pay the mortgage to my friends, actually. And I lived pretty much for free by owning this house. So I always had this kind of survival. How do I make things work kind of sensibility? So tech tech during the 1980s, I, I kind of made more money than I'd ever seen in my life because I could write databases and install networks for people and teach them how to use them. So I, I, I actually became not poor for the first time in the 1980s. And, and by 1994, honestly, uh, I don't think I would like myself if I met the 1994 version of myself. I, I was kind of complacent, lazy, why? Because I had enough income. I could come to Italy on vacations if I wanted to. 
and did uh, often four or five times a year I'd be going to vacation somewhere and that was a dramatic change for me I I only traveled outside the UK for the first time when I was 32 years old so I wow. you know it's like yeah. it it changed a lot who I was I discovered food that wasn't really bad English food you know I so I, I started to understand bigger things. And in 1994, I said to my brother, who was my business partner, I'm super lazy. I'm totally complacent. I want you to fire me. You can, you can own this business. I give you the whole business. Uh, as long as you will pay me for six months, I'm going to try something new. And I, I started um, EasyNet, which was with a partner, David Rowe. We met through database related work and we, we used a credit card, $35,000 to buy the equipment needed to start an internet service provider, which in 1994, there was, no, there was not, no such thing. Windows didn't yet have the internet. And so I figured out how to make Windows be an internet client. And we built the software stack to make that possible. It was all open source software. And between June 94 and August 94, I bought, learned and wrote the software for EasyNet and in two months. And EasyNet opened in August 94, 10 pounds a month for internet with uh, dial-up modems. First one in Europe uh, for consumers. And within 15 months, it was a public company on the London wow. Stock Exchange. So this is all, you know, I think it's a common theme, escaping limited contexts to try to get to bigger contexts. Yeah. So what was and, the average time in each of your endeavors, let's say, or ventures? Since, since then, or, or up until then? Well, since then, I guess, yeah. Yeah, because up, up until then, my company that did databases was called Brent, which is a district of London, Brent Computer Services. And I did that from the early 80s to the mid 90s, so 12 years maybe. And I was politically active the whole time through that as well. I was, I was running campaigns. I wrote a book, I wonder if I have it here. Yeah. I wrote this book, which is... Um, uh, for Penguin. Uh, and it's about racism in England. Um, this was okay. 19, published in 1988. So I was, I was leading campaigns, doing speeches, writing books, and the database stuff on this, you know, as to make money. But I found the database stuff super easy. So most of my time was spent on politics and the database stuff paid for that. But by 94, when I started EasyNet, I became 100% focused on, on the work. I stopped doing politics as a thing that took a lot of my time. And I was the chief technology officer, which is kind of weird with my background, but I, I understood networking, I understood the software side. So I, I was the chief technology officer. And for the first time in my life, I thought I, I was doing okay before, but for the first time in my life, I discovered that equity in a startup has value, even though the startup is still very young. A friend of mine offered to put 250,000 pounds into EasyNet. And that was super important because we couldn't raise venture capital. There was very little venture capital in London at the time. And insofar as there was venture capital, it wasn't available to people with my regional accent. England's very, very class aware. And, it, and when you have a regional accent, you're clearly from the lower part of society. And, and so when we met venture capitalists, within five minutes, you knew they were not going to give you money. Because uh, you just would, were not one of them. The, the pattern recognition didn't work for them. So we got money from a friend. That friend did, ended up making 50 million pounds from 250,000. So he did super well. And we IPO'd. And after the IPO, companies become very boring after an IPO because what happens is they don't want to innovate anymore. They just want to grow revenue. 
Mm-hmm. So I actually left EasyNet a year after the IPO. Okay. And so and, I, and in order to, order to leave that to sell my shares, which I actually probably didn't have to, but I was naive and I was told I had to, so I did. So I sold, I own 20% of EasyNet. I sold it for 5 million pounds. A year later, the same shares would have been worth 200 million pounds. Wow, okay. So, however, what, what made you sell them? Was it an easy thing? Okay, I'll just sell them. It's... Well, there was a buyer, an institutional buyer called Hall Gavette, which is a big private equity house. I should have been clever enough to realize if they wanted to buy them, I shouldn't want to sell them. But I did sell them and I moved to the US. And okay. I, I mean, from my point of view, I had more money than I could have ever dreamed of. I could buy a house which I'd never been able to do before. I did buy a flat in London actually earlier, but this was the first time I bought a, a house. And I was two years married by then. I got married in 92. We, we only had our first kids in 2001. So between 96, when I left the UK in 2001, I was in Silicon Valley doing the next level up, which was again escaping. I thought the UK was too constraining. The experience of trying to raise money and failing and having to get money from a friend and then do a very fast IPO to all of that was dealing with constraint. And so I moved to Palo Alto really to try to be in the place where there were the least constraints. So what did, did your view on the UK change since you moved? Well, I love the UK like anyone loves where they made their first experiences. London, I think, is a spectacular city, even more than ever. It's it's so diverse. There's so many different cultures. To me, it's a fantastic city. But the UK risk appetite is extremely narrow. So there are great venture capitalists there now, people like Saul Klein at Local Globe or Reshma Sahoni at Seed Camp and many, many others. Um, so I do think that the UK is, is a healthier ecosystem than it's ever been, but it isn't Palo Alto. Pa- Palo Alto is many steps above that. So you still think that where the tech is and where the next, uh, I don't know if we, we call them now unicorns, decacorns or whatever corns, <laughs> is it still there and for the next 10 years? Yeah, it it hasn't been only here for quite a while now. I think the percentage of unicorns coming out of Silicon Valley is now at or around about 50%. <clears throat> China is second and London and the UK is third, I think. So clearly things are flattening and leveling. <clears throat> but if you look at the recent developments in AI, I think about 90% of all the AI investments this year came from Silicon Valley, nine zero. So it's still much earlier than everybody else. It's prepared to put money into new things. People call that a bubble. I actually think a bubble is the word to describe an opportunity. When, When there's an opportunity, money is attracted usually too much money, but the reason it's attractive is because of the opportunity. And so the the narrative really shouldn't be about the bubble. It should be about the opportunity. And AI clearly is an opportunity. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's all we hear about, I guess, (laughs) today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to go back to when we met a few years ago. You said, I'm paraphrasing here, but you said what mobile phones did to the internet is that it made it global, uh, it, it kind of democratized the impact yeah. uh, where tech used to be for the elites. Where is AI or what is AI doing to the world today? Yeah, well, so when, when, I, when I said that, I said it from two points of view. The, the first is that billions of people on the planet can have a smartphone and so have mm-hmm. access to everything that 
the, the smartphone can deliver to them. The second reason I said it is people who write software have only two points of distribution, um, Google App Store and Apple App Store. And through those two, where you can uh, upload software today, by tomorrow, four or five billion people theoretically can use it. So the, so the second global, globalizing thing is the infrastructure for software distribution is fully globalized. Now, a AI benefits from that uh, because AI, at least from the point of view of the user, is just an app on a phone uh, or an app on another device. Or, uh, you know, with this new device that was announced this week, the PIN, it's, it's software running on a, on a device that doesn't have a screen. Um, yeah. So AI to me uh, couldn't really um, be distributed if it was not for what happened with mobile. But the second part is it couldn't even be created without developments in, in computational power. And there I'm thinking of uh, CPUs and GPUs and things called ASICs, basically dedicated chips for AI. And when you put together mobile, the cloud, and the hardware platforms that have evolved, um, large language models, which is what everyone thinks about today as AI, become possible. And a large language model is basically uh, best thought of as brute force intelligence. Brute force meaning you just give it everything. It can use everything you give it. And just because of the weight of what it has access to, its training makes it have access to everything the human race can give it. And so suddenly, you know, if you take any discipline, Let's just take a discipline like physics. Suddenly, there are very few teachers on the planet better than the AI at physics. And that's true for any specialism. For any specialism, the AI will be better than probably the top 5% of experts in the field. So suddenly, the human impact in leveraging knowledge so as to enhance human capability it's never been, it's never been this good. And of course it's going to transform everything. Just, just like the calculator transform math, AI is going to trans transform every single discipline and it's going to do it quick, quickly. It won't be slow. Question, going back to what you were saying about education, well, at, you know, when you were at school and you had set expectations by somebody else in the society and, and how the system worked. In hindsight, do you do you wish you had an AI teacher? <laughs> like, how can you see traditional education changing? Well, in, if you combine all the things I had then, which which basically was a typewriter, a public library, and school, that was probably a slow version of the human race, collective knowledge being delivered to me and my ability to consume it and then develop who I am by using it when I wrote things. So that process of gathering together knowledge, making it available, and then people taking advantage of it to make themselves, that is kind of somewhat eternal in human history and, and consistent. So the thing that changes is the tools to do it with. And the, the, the better the tools get, humans are super good at taking in and learning from information. And my children all speak fluent Spanish. Why do they speak mm -hmm. Spanish? Because from the age of less than one year old, we put them into Spanish speaking nursery environments they, we put them into elementary school for six years that was only Spanish, okay. no English. And they taught themselves English because it's easy because everyone around them was speaking English. But Spanish is natural to them. So that ability of a human being to take in and become something 
is is a huge so the better you can package up the things and give them the you know what do children do most they ask questions mm -hmm. of, often irritatingly so they're hey what what is this hey what does that do hey what about this well suddenly they can ask as many questions as, as they want of an ai that never goes to sleep and knows a lot now you know there's dangers in that because as we both know the ai is not perfect yet uh, probably never will be perfect so they have to also have critical thinking they have not just assume that what they're being told is right the same with the teacher by the way you shouldn't assume mm -hmm. the teacher's always right so they need critical thinking as well but now the ability to access and engage with things is is going to be fantastic yeah, you, you touched on a point that I uh, usually like to, to talk about is critical thinking here. As we're recording this, I mean, this week, custom GPTs have been released, right? And I was telling you offline that I tried to do gut AI, and like you also tried to do signal rank AI and so on. And I didn't want AI to just give the answer, but to make the user think. So they get the right answer, but it just gets it because I think for me, at least, the way I learn, but the way I also teach is I don't just give the answer. I, I don't make it hard, I would say, but I would try to get the others to work a little bit hard, even though if they get tired after, just to never forget, because it's so easy to forget as well. Yeah, yeah. But it... I didn't manage to do that on a custom GPT just yet. So I, I started and failed to do the signal rank AI version uh, this weekend. I, I started and failed three times. Every time I failed, I learned something about why I failed. And so the most recent one I did is way better than the previous ones. It still isn't perfect. It's all to do with what do you give it to learn from and what parameters do you put around it for using what you give it and to what extent do you let it think for itself versus training only on your data uh, it will result mm -hmm. in very different outcomes. So yeah, there's a lot of trial and error, like with any tool. I, I once bought myself a synthesizer because I thought I, I could hear music in my head and I wanted a way to make music and I'm not musical. So I bought a synthesizer and in that case, I failed. I think I've bought a synth synthesizer maybe three times in my life. Every single time I ended up selling it because I couldn't figure it out. With ChatGPT, I'm figuring it out little by little. Yeah, well, it's your area, right? So yeah. <laughs> you, you understand it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually changing the way we, we work with software anyway. Before we would, we're not using, used, we're not used to working with, we're used to yeah. just giving a command and kind of knowing what to expect. And so, what to get. So, yeah, I, that's a good way of thinking. So my primary use of chat GPT this year at signal rank, I, I invented what's called a heuristic model for predicting outcomes in venture capital. And, I, and to do that, I had to write a programming language called SQL, SQL. And back in the eighties, I actually did learn SQL. I worked with the very first versions, but I haven't used it for 30, 40 years. So I had kind of a basic memory of it. And I spent maybe before chat GPT, I maybe spent six months writing my own SQL using uh, a product called Snowflake, which is a public company here. And I'd probably say I was like, a, you know, a B minus level of capability in writing SQL. Then chat GPT came out and I started sharing the code I'd written with it and explaining my purpose and it upgraded my code to a plus plus and I could just copy and paste it and run it and test it. And then if there was an error, go back and say, no, that look, this is an error. And it would say, oh yeah, of course I forgot this. And what it is like to me actually is an expert in SQL that's way better than I am. But like a professor hasn't been coding itself for many years. So sometimes gets it wrong. 
And if you point out where it gets it wrong, it fixes it. So it's highly iterative. I can tell you signal ranks code base could not have been written by me. And I'm the only human to have touched it. So you've written the whole software yourself. I've written the whole software myself for, for single rank. Now I will say single rank has a data science team. They have a totally different project. It's, it's not what I described as a heuristic model. They have a machine learning model that the job of which is to be better than me. And they're miles ahead of me in their capabilities, but their model is worse than mine right now. Uh, my model's better. Okay. That will not be true a year from now because they, they, they've only been doing what they're doing for two years. I've been doing what I'm doing for maybe 10 years. They, they, and they're already almost equal to me in how good it is. So they will get there. So, the, but the code that's live at SingRank is all my code. But it's also, it has to do with the approach. I mean, you said you have 10 years. It's not just number of years, obviously. It, it's your experience and, and, and what you know. I don't know how to explain. It's just not the number in that case. Yeah. yeah this yeah, is you... hard to, to just like, I don't know, do in like a year or two, right? Yes, it is. The first, the first tests I did, I've still got the spreadsheets, were in 2013. And wow. in 2013, okay. I wrote spreadsheets that tried to test some assumptions I had about venture capital. Huge spreadsheets that Google had trouble running because they were too big, because I needed lots of data to test on. So I, I had spreadsheets with maybe uh, 70,000 rows, which doesn't seem like very many if you're using databases, but for a spreadsheet, that's a lot of rows. And then lots of calculations happening, a, a, against that. And 2013, I kind of knew that my thesis was right, but it took some trial and error. I, I only did the first investments using the thesis in 2016. By 2019, those investments made a lot of money, 20 times the investment in three years. And then I knew it worked and I only started signal rank in 2021. So from 2013 to 2021 was this idea was in my head. I was testing it. And I'm one of those people that unless I believe in something, I can't do it. I can't sell stuff I know is not right. I, I can only really get passionate when I know something's right or, or works. And the goal of signal rank is to make venture capital available to everyone as an investment type. Most people in the world can't invest in venture capital because it's too risky. Actually, what I do is I make it not risky, which seems a weird statement, but basically you, you're using statistics and math to take away the risk. And when you do that, you're left with the good stuff. You know, if you, if, if so the goal of, of signal rank is to remove risk and what remains is way less risky. So going back to optimism. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How did you come up with this idea? Like what, is it just an overnight thing where you had, or like while showering, or I don't know, you had this, because it's, as you said, it's a big statement to do actually. It's, it, well, it started with a, with a question. I wrote an essay in 2013. It's called, the essay is on Medium. It's called, This is Not Silicon Valley. So if anyone Googles, this is not Silicon Valley and Keith Tier is the name, it'll come up in Google. And that essay, I wrote it on the island of Hainan in China. I, I was in China doing two speeches, one in Guangzhou and one in Shenzhen. And there was uh, five days in between where I, I had nothing to do. And Hainan is like the Hawaii of China. So uh, it's one hour flight from Guangzhou. So I said, okay, I'm going to, uh, I, I had five nights on hotels.com free hotel because of all okay. the stays. And I, I spent my five nights and went to Hainan and I wrote, this is not Silicon Valley during those five days. And it has a, a pencil drawing. I had the first iPad where you could use a pencil. I did this pencil drawing called the Valley of Death. 
And on the left-hand side was all the seed investments. Then there was all the death of the companies that didn't make it. And on the right-hand side was all the growth investments by uh, well-known brands today, people like Tiger Global, um, that, that were writing very large checks to companies that were yeah. successful. But in the middle was death. And the problem there was a lot of good companies die. Co companies that shouldn't die do die. And they're not really given enough time. And, and th at that time, there was this idea in the air called Lean Startup, which Eric yeah. Reese coined, that basically said, you can build a startup for nothing and it can succeed very fast. And I felt deep in my soul that that was wrong because the key part of a startup is people. And Eric Reese was right that the cost of computing came down, but people are not free. And, and so actually a good startup needs two things. It needs time and people. And that's the one thing Lean Startup didn't allow. So the only startups that got funded were the successful lean startups got funded. But anything that had a bigger vision that wanted to do something big couldn't get the money to do it anymore. And so I felt like this was broken, that from the point of view of innovation and entrepreneurs, uh, you needed time and people. So this is not Silicon Valley was my statement that short termism was taking over from long-term thinking. And so then I said, okay, how do you get, by the way, at that time, there were lots of unicorns beginning to be formed. By 2013, the word unicorn, I don't think it had been coined yet, but maybe it had. And so the question I asked is, how could more founders understand how to build a unicorn and benefit from it? And how could the early investors who invest in these companies not lose their investment in this valley of death. And so I had lots of questions in my mind about the very structure of venture capital. And that started my brain thinking. And the first thing I asked is, are there any patterns that help you understand very, very early, which companies are likely to be unicorns? And so the math of signal rank is answering the question, as early as possible, what are the chances of this company becoming a unicorn? And I can answer that question about three times better than the average performance in the market. I can answer it at the seed round, the A round, the B round, all funding rounds for those who aren't familiar with venture capital. At the B round, I can predict a unicorn one out of three times. Wow, okay. Uh, at the A round, I can pick a unicorn one out of seven times. At the okay. seed round, I can pick a unicorn one out of 10 times. Well, it's still better than a, Way a better. fund. <laughs> yeah. so. Better than any fund. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and, and I have a kind of a way of doing that. The reason it worked is because of the, as you were saying, that experience you kind of understand the patterns. You have to think abstractly, but if you think abstractly, the patterns that give a signal that this is a potential future unicorn very early, those patterns are discoverable. The, the thing that's going to my mind is you're taking qualitative data primarily and making it quantitative with yes. numbers. Yeah. How is that working? In, well, in this case, because you're, you're having good predictions. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a fund here in the UK. Actually, I forgot uh, the name, but they were supposed to raise their third fund and they're not doing it. And they invested heavily in about 50 startups already. Yeah. Well, I, I'll give you an example you, using my approach. And uh, I will answer your question, but just to give you an example, why Combinator is obviously the biggest incubator mm -hmm. on the planet. In the last 10 years, Y Combinator invested in 140 B rounds. So not very many, they, they do 250 mm -hmm. companies every six months. 
they did 140 B rounds. My algorithm predicted 124 of them. Now they spent $400 million on those 140 rounds and the value today is 2.5 billion. Now here's the interesting thing. My algorithm also predicted an, another 170 B rounds that they did not do. Okay. Those would have produced the same outcome. Uh, roughly $500 million would have been needed and 2.5 billion would have come out. So the, 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 so they're really good, but they missed 50% of the opportunity. Is that, um, in this case, is the data, let, no, let's put it that way. You're talking about where YC investing in those startups. Yeah, I Could just been took, anyone uh, else investing or it's based oh, on no, other, people, other people are investing. Okay. Uh, but I'm focused okay. in on the on the decision makers at YC. Yeah. What did they do? And what would they have done if they listened to the signal rank algorithm? Yeah. And the answer okay. is if they listened to the signal rank al algorithm, they would have doubled their money. Yeah. Um and, and now uh, and they're they're really good. So so we wouldn't have improved the ones they did do. So it's mm -hmm. finding the ones they didn't do where we made a difference. And and that okay. that that analysis could be done for any investor. I, I could do that for any investor. I'm just choosing Y Combinator. Now, how do we do it? How do we turn qualitative data into quantitative? We you know, you're probably familiar with this idea of money ball in sports. Um, yes. Money ball is using data to build teams. Um, what we are is money ball for investors. We score. And Series B at the moment. Actually, we score every round, even pre oh, you, you are. We okay, I thought round. you were focusing on Series B. On t so you've launched everything, actually. Everything's accessible. And everything is launched, except we only we only write checks at Series B. But we score, yeah, okay. but we score everything. And okay. the reason we score everything is you can't tell how good a Series B is without information about the prior round. Yeah. So a Series B does not stand alone all by itself. This company oh. has a history. Now, the company's history is not available as public knowledge. You often don't know where the team went to college or there are many venture investors try to score the company through the team and various other things. We don't. We score investors, only investors. Now, an investor has a history and the history resulted in outcomes. And the history is either repetitive or not. You know, it's like, like in music, a band can have one hit record or it can have a hundred. The one that has a hundred, you can predict the next one, the chance of a hit is high. So we do that with investors. We look at their history, very specific to the stage. So we, we have scores for pre-seed investing, seed investing, A round investing, B round investing. We don't mix these scores. It's, it's how good are you at this stage? We also score the partners in the fund. Okay. Um, we, we score all of them. Now those scores are based on five years of history. So if you were really good 10 years ago, it doesn't matter. You've got to be good now. Um, and, and if you were only good last year, it isn't enough. You have to be good for five years. Um, and, and so that creates a filtering effect, uh, like a league table, like in soccer, the number one, number two, number three investor at pre-seed in the last five years. And, uh, the definition of good is, is measurable. It's how many investments did you make? How many of them produced positive outcomes versus negative outcomes? How positive was the outcome on a scale of one to a hundred? Um, how many unicorns did you make and how many did you not make, um, okay. as a relative score, many, many things. There's, we have about 200 different data points for each investor. And then we create a league table. Now, if, if you then look at a funding round 
there may be five investors in a funding round. And I can say, well, what is their collective score? Now, now I have a round score. And when the company is doing the B round, I probably have three round scores, one for seed, one for A, and now one for B. So that gives me a company score. So from investor score, I get to round score, I get to company score. Yeah. The correlation between a company score and the future outcome is very high. So, so you you have to keep updating actually this um, data it's base live. constantly. It's actually live. We we created a brain. You have okay. My, my heuristic is the brain. Okay. It, it basically <laughs> has all the variables. Yeah. Every day it gets new information about new funding rounds, and um, it calculates a threshold score equal to this round being in the top 5% of all rounds. And if the score beats the threshold at the B round, that company has a one in three chance of being a unicorn. Okay. And the threshold changes every day, according to the data. So is your aim to have instead of one of three, one of two, is that your next step? Or are you... one, one of three is so good. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you probably can't improve on that easily. Uh, I've tried many ways to improve on it and they're almost n none of them ever result in improvement. So I think we'll see, probably we can improve on it. The machine learning guys have a better chance than me because you need to see more variables and how they interact, mm -hmm. uh, than, than the heuristic can deal with. So probably they, they, they will eventually get there. Um, now, now, just stand back a little bit. Venture capital, everyone knows, is a is what's called a power law game. I'm sorry, I'm if I sound like I'm preaching here. But the power law says this: if you make a hundred investments, one of them will make you a hundred times your money and return the entire investments. So it's gambling. Venture capital is gambling, and you you. It's very different to say in the public markets, you can invest in an index like the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500, and you can get the average results of the market in, in, into your bank account. In venture capital, historically, there's been no way to index venture capital uh, because of this widespread of outcomes. Uh, if you would have invested in every single B round in the last 10 years, you would have had to have made 19,000 investments and you would have gotten 300% gain. So it would have been a good decision if you could do it, but nobody can invest in 19,000 B rounds. What Single Rank has done is created a subset of B rounds that in five years, the average outcome is five times your money the average. And in order to achieve the average, you only need to make 10 investments. Um, okay. 10 investments removes the randomness. And so instead of the power law where you've got to pick one in 100, we can pick 10 and deliver five times your money in five years on average. Of course, uh, that's not a promise. Markets change. But based on history, that's what we would have done. And, uh, and we can pick one in three unicorns based on history. So what we've created is the possibility of indexing venture capital uh, for a normal consumer. It's better than a savings account. So yeah, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's fascinating actually. What uh, because I've always heard you talk about the single rank, but I never understood re like exactly what it is. So yeah, well, so now you know that we're very early because the full end game for single rank is to own lots of companies B rounds, hundreds. Yeah. And okay. for signal rank to be listed on the stock exchange okay. so that you can buy a signal rank share as the equivalent of buying all these B rounds. Okay. So do you so, know more or less when, when you're planning to do that? I know when I'm planning to do it. I don't know if my plan will survive the real world, but the, the plan <laughs> okay. is, the plan is between 2027 and 2028. Okay. 
So we raise money today. Uh, we, ha we have a pool of shares we sell. A anyone can buy our shares today if they're what's called a an accredited investor. We're not allowed to take money from uh, non-accredited investors. But if you're an accredited investor or, or better, uh, our shares are priced at $25 and we sell them every 90 days. And we take that money and we buy B rounds that we score highly. Okay. So it's like an investment yeah. uh, program for long-term gains, just like a retirement account would be. You, that's yeah, how you think yeah. about it. Yeah, going back to like where VC funds get their money from anyway. So, uh, but that's um, an interesting model because I think you, you can create lots of other companies from what you're doing, uh, yep. kind of alternative businesses and so on, just from the data you have. Like, how can you improve your, like, basically some funds? Okay, you're not performing well. We can help you, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, no, we can partner with, there's a, there's a thing in seed stage venture capital called an opportunity fund. An, an opportunity fund or a continuity fund that's when a fund creates a special pool of capital only for investing more in the companies it already invested in. And typically those funds are very inefficient because there's a strong incentive to invest in more companies than you should in your portfolio. It's called uh, adverse selection. We want to partner with those uh, funds to provide the capital. So instead of them raising an opportunity fund, uh, we, we will supply the capital uh, like uh, any fund investor would, but only in the companies that score highly. So you create the competition <laughs> amongst yeah. them as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is changing the model anyway. I mean, I've been listening to you for a while, right? And you've been saying that venture capital is changing anyway. And now with AI, it's going to change even more. So... Yeah. Uh, where you might not need to raise uh, money or probably in the way you used to. So what's your take on this and where is signal rank in this like change? Yeah, it's interesting. So Chamath Palihapitiya did a speech this week saying that it is not impossible that startups will become one or two people with an AI mm -hmm. and will figure out how to make large amounts of value without building teams or infrastructure. He said that if that happens, there'll be no longer a reason for venture capitalists. And David Hornick, who is a, another venture capitalist who was at August Capital and now runs his own fund, disagreed and said, you know, if that ever happens, it's decades away. And what is required now is infrastructure, all the different layers required to make AI work. And those are real businesses and venture capitalists are going to be still required for a long time. So there's a debate around that. Single rank is basically a statistical analytics company. You could think of us as a fintech because we've created an asset class. The asset class is uh, B-round investments uh, through partnerships with seed investors. We basically give them the money and they put it into their companies. So we're a fintech that uses AI to create statistical analysis on likely outcomes. And we're, we're you know, the, the, the heuristic is really, really good at correlating to outcomes. So we, we, you could think of us as a digital venture capitalist. We're, we're not data driven. We're data only. We don't use data as a supplement to human decision making. The humans serve the data. The data says make this investment, the humans make it happen. And so the, the idea of a digital venture capitalist being able to rank likely outcomes, I don't think that goes away. I think it just gets better and better. Today, however, our ability to be good relies on scoring actual venture capitalists. If, if there were no venture capitalists, we wouldn't be able to score them. So in, in the future, we'll be scoring algorithms. Uh, so you're, not... you're getting ready for that. Yeah. Is um, Signal, I mean, I guess Signal Rank is global, right? We made already this year, we only started investing in March, I should tell you that. 
Uh, we only started selling our shares for investment purposes in March. And so the first money came in in March and we started investing in, in June, actually. We've, do, we've done nine investments in B rounds so far, led by people like Sequoia Capital, Axel, Andreessen Horowitz. I mean, top, top B rounds. So we solved the access problem. That Because knowing the good companies is only half the story. You have to be able to put money into them. Yeah, um, for sure. And so we solved the access problem. And I think we'll end up in the next 10 years, we'll probably do 500 investments in B rounds as, as part of this index. And no single investment will be able to really change the results. It's going to be the collective uh, yeah. average of all of them. And, Sorry, I, I forgot. And that's your global. And that's global. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's why I was saying it. So in the first uh, nine, uh, I think. Six are in the US and three are not. Um, I have a question here because I um, did a, a podcast also with Bernard Moon and, uh, you know, they are started in like Asia, Australia, the US, and they're now in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So, and Saudi Arabia, other than getting football players and investing heavily in culture, um, entertainment and so on. There's movement also in the startup world, but also it's it's a young population and uh, it's an active population. And now the six GCC countries introduced a unified visa for the six countries. And that's going to affect business, not just tourism. So what's your take on the region, actually? I think we're going to see the largest change in, in geographical... Uh, wealth in the next 50 years that, that we've seen for a long time. So Saudi Arabia, you know, is kind of contradictory because it's a modernizing economy, but it's starting from a set of structures that you couldn't normally describe as modern. So it's, it's very modernizing. Um, the Neom project in the desert is, yeah. it's, it's either crazy or spectacular, depending on your point of view. And, and probably both. <laughs> but now the other part of the world that is very different, but also you need to, one needs to understand it is uh, Africa, uh, especially Nigeria. Nigeria is going to become one of the biggest countries in the world in the next 50 years and wealthiest. Uh, it has natural resources and minerals as lots of Africa does. And then of course, the one we all know about is Asia where the 66 percent of the world's middle class will be in asia by 2050 and the middle class are the people who spend money on mass so you know we're living in a time when the global footprint if you think of it as weighing scales by country the the us is going to go down to weigh less asia already is up weighing a lot more and India and the Middle East and Africa are all going to come up as well. So it, it, it now the many things could thwart this. For example, the decline of America's ability to be the world's policeman will lead to military conflicts that would not have happened earlier in history. Not I'm not saying it was good that America was the world policeman, but it did make a difference to decision making that they were so powerful. Okay. And, and that decision-making now can factor in that America is less prepared to act. And I think that um, it's a dangerous era, an era of potentially huge wealth coexists with the danger of potentially huge conflict. And so managing that is non-trivial. And it actually would involve America understanding that it is not going to be number one forever and managing its future relationship to the world in a peaceful way. Now, that's probably the biggest factor. And Saudi Arabia is, you know, in a good position from that point of view, because it's friendly with America and with China. Yeah, true. Um, so you're staying in America now. Uh, you know, I'm getting old. So at some point, my wife is from Cape Town in South Africa, and I have my eye on a nice little beach cottage where I can peacefully decline. 
um, but not for a probably. I've probably got a good ten years in me still, and after that, we'll see. Okay, so you're not doing any political activism at the moment. You're just like on that was the week. Like Andrew always cuts you off when you try to go into a political uh, debate or something. So he does. Uh, I sh- I'm sure you still have a keen interest in politics because this shapes the way it you does. know have your uh, yeah thoughts and ideas and so does. on. So. Well, I, you know, my belief is that political activism is only fruitful if large numbers of people want to make change. I, I don't believe real change comes in private rooms. I think no, real, no. real change happens on the street when, when, you know, you could see it, you could see it even in, in if you go back in American history, the civil rights protests would not have been as successful if it wasn't for the fact that millions of people were marching uh, and the politicians felt compelled to make changes. And of course they always filter down the change to the minimum they can get away with to try to appease po- the population. So a political activist is, is only as powerful as the underlying sentiment. And the, the problem we have today is we've become individualized to such an extent that most people's perspective is very personal to themselves and not analyzing social structures and the need for change anymore. So um, how is AI going to like help? change or open the minds in different way for critical thinking also. I, I think there's a, a kind of a dance that happens between innovation and freedom. I think, you know, these are deep questions, but the ultimate question is, you know, in the, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, it was a popular point of view was that in order to make societal change, you need a revolution. And people focused on revolutions, not economics. However, a real reading of history tells you that economics and innovation produce enough wealth to free people from slavery to work. And so my current belief is that innovation and economics, especially AI and the ability for machines to do jobs, will lead to the largest amount of wealth the world has ever seen. And the problem will change from producing wealth to distributing wealth. How, how do, how does this wealth get into the hands of everyone? Sam Altman actually has a separate project called Worldcoin that tries to answer that question. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. So I, I, I think that the production of wealth and the distribution of wealth are correlated. Uh, the question of whether you need a revolution for that wealth to be distributed evenly or somewhat evenly across the world, according to uh, people's needs. Open question. But I, I actually think that we're closer to utopia in that regard than we've ever been. And utopia removes the biggest reason wars happen is nations fighting for ownership of resources. And, and, and so if the human race can start seeing a, a future based on wealth production, they will also start seeing troublesome nations who want to fight wars as a problem. We may get to that Star Trek moment where we're just human beings and we're all in it together. Yeah, that, I mean, I admire your optimism. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. But, uh, I mean, it's good to stay positive. But I, I, the distribution of wealth in that sense, I mean, that's really utopia for me. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think the raw material, I, I, I would say never try to solve problems that where the capability to solve them does not already exist. So, mm-hmm. because then you have to do R and D to figure out how to solve the problem. But if the if the capability to solve the problem already exists, then all you have to do is decide to do it. It's a little bit like Uber. Uber, not, Uber didn't have to invent anything. Everything already existed. You just have to decide to make Uber. So I think that's true of distribution of wealth. 
we, we already have the computational power to understand every human being on the planet existence and to allocate through blockchains credits to them. We already have the, the political will to avoid a world in which a small number of oligarchs own everything, which is the other possible future. Yeah, I, I, I lean more towards this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the latter. That's the question. Is the will there? Well, like, it, it comes down to Sil Silvio Berlusconi versus Keith Tier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think most people, will, even though I am not very interesting, I do think I'm better than Silvio Berlusconi when it comes yeah, to... Yeah, I would vote for you for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So a question here, you, you spoke about your instincts at the beginning, and I always ask this question at some point, usually on the podcast, is does your gut or you have some impulses that drive your decisions? I, I do. It's probably a struggle for me to identify what they are anymore because they're all kind of intuitive now. I don't know how mm -hmm. conscious I am about them. One of my impulses is, is not to be bored pretty strong. So when I wake up in the morning, I want to be excited about the day. So I, I set myself problems that it's like put doing puzzles. You know, I like solving puzzles, in my case, human puzzles. And so something that is broken that needs fixing is a good motivator for me. And venture capital, I think is one of those. So the first impulse is, is not to be bored. The second is to produce an outcome that makes things better than the current outcome. Uh, but I wouldn't claim to be like this charitable, benevolent, nice person who only thinks about goodness because the puzzle probably is the stronger instinct and my ethics would mean I wouldn't focus on bad things. Uh, but I think that's a secondary driver. The primary driver is solving the puzzle. So let's wrap up, actually, even though maybe we should do another one in a few months, if you're okay. Yeah. So, all right. So I think I have lots of things to ask, but I think we're going to stop here, just being conscious of time. Thank you so much uh, yeah. for this. We, um, and, we can, and we can definitely do a second one. Just figure out what you want to do it and when you want to do it, and we'll do one. And, and thank you for cool. giving me the opportunity to talk. I'm, I'm, my wife always tells me I like talking. No, it's, it was uh, brilliant. And thank you for sharing so much on Signal Rank. I think this bit will be very valuable as well. Have a lovely Sunday. <laughs> thank you. I for will. It. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you've derived value from the show, you can subscribe on platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Your feedback is incredibly important to us. So please consider rating the show or leaving a review. It's a fantastic way to help other podcast explorers discover our content. To gain more insights, visit our website at ggutt.com. This is wgutt.com and see you next time.